Hello, everybody. Uh, quite a tough day, I must say. I hope you still have some energy to listen to mine and, and, and afterwards lecture. I uh, hope you didn't party too much last night. I have to thank the organizers for the uh, opportunity to present uh, results of, of our project. Now, uh, judging by the program in the previous presentations, you heard pretty much uh, all in theory about the uh, open data sharing, fair data uh, principles. So uh, I was invited to give you, as was presented before, to give you a hands-on example uh, how these things work when you give them in the real life experience. So I will present to you uh, our European research pro project, Migrant Children and Communities in a Transforming Europe, acronym MICREATE. And uh, I was acting there as a data management officer. Uh, let me just briefly present what I'm going to talk about. First, brief presentation of our institution, just to give you a short context what we are uh, dealing with, brief presentation of the uh, research project itself, and then we'll go into step-by-step -step research data management plan and uh, data management plan itself as a document that, was, uh, that we were working on within the, the project. Uh, a few sections, more or less chronologically divided, First, preparations before the actual start of the project, the initial DMP, DM, I will be using the short DMP for the data management plan, uh, ethical issues that arose from, from uh, what we were working on, uh, DMP update, uh, data archiving as a sort of a final process of, of um, uh, research data management, and last but not least, as it was stressed, several times today uh, reporting to European Commission because it's the funder that usually dictates what one uh, uh, what uh, researchers have to um, uh, aspire to and uh, last slide lessons that I hope we learned and we will be able to follow in in the future to come in our future research from uh, what we were working on uh, within this project so I suggest we move on if you're okay with that. Now, uh, as it was said, I work at the Science and Research Center in Koper, short Zurese uh, Koper. Uh, our seat is in uh, uh, Koper on the Adriatic coast. For those of you that are not um, acquainted with that, uh, we have eight research groups, institutes as we call them, uh, that stretch from humanities, social sciences, biotechnology, natural sciences. So, you know, you name it, we, we have it. And this naturally causes quite a few uh, interesting issues while dealing with, with uh, research data. On top of that, we have 11 infrastructural u uh, units. Uh, this is what how we call uh, our laboratories. Uh, we have a chemical laboratory, kinesiology laboratory, public opinion center, publishing house, research library, and so forth and so on. Uh, what we work on is are mostly national and international research projects. Uh, so we are practically constantly on the run for money, if I put it bluntly. Uh, and this is mostly how we how we operate. If you would be interested in uh, knowing some more about our institution, there is our uh, internet site. My role at Zurese Koper is, as it was uh, said before, I'm head of the Center for IT and Infrastructural Support to Research. Basically, IT computers, things like that. Uh, I'm head of the research library. On top of that, I am uh, admin and tech editor of our uh, online publishing uh, journals. But in short, perhaps I would mostly describe myself as uh, somebody who is aspiring to become a research data steward. You will remember a couple of lectures ago, uh, this, this role was, was described as somebody who is uh, 
guiding over the over the research management within the within the institution. Let's move on. My current project it's within the Horizon 2020 research European research program. Now uh, I don't know how much you know about it. Those schemes were mentioned a couple of times uh, before today. We have Horizon 2020. This is a the biggest research scheme within the European Union. Uh, it ended more or less in 2020. Some things were pushed forward to 2021-22. Uh, From uh, uh, year 2021, the new scheme named Horizon Europe is going on. Uh, but this is pretty much the same. And this is usually the research institution when, when they get a grant within the uh, Horizon 2020 before or Horizon Europe now, they're pretty happy because these are the, the these are major research research projects uh, the research team was consisted of uh, 15 project partners from 12 different countries you can see the map so you can find because you're such an interesting international group you can find uh, some of your countries uh, on the map there's quite a few um, countries matching to two participants of, of this course. The lead partner of uh, the project was ZRS Copper, my institution. And uh, the project itself started with the beginning of 2019 and uh, was due to end at the end of uh, 21, but was then um, prolonged for another six months. And it ended at uh, the end of June this year. So you see only just finished the actual research project. <coughs> we were the, the um, reports to the European Commission were, were due to the end of the uh, August this year. So we are now anxious and eagerly waiting the responses from the funder, whether they will be satisfied with the reports that we, that we placed in. So um, some of the things I will be talking about today are not confirmed yet. Let's hope for the best. Let's move on. By the way, if you have any questions in the meantime, or if I wander into some areas that you're not familiar with, just stop me. We can discuss that. Or if I start talking something that everybody is well familiar with, just let me know, and we will, we will move on faster. Just a few lines about the contents of our project. Uh, Migrate, you know from the title of the project, Migrant Children Europe. It's all about stimulation of the inclusion of diverse groups of migrant children. And one thing that cannot be stressed enough, it was taken, uh, we, the researchers took the child-centered approach, meaning we really were interested in what do children think, what would they do to improve and upgrade the policy that is going on uh, nowadays within the uh, migration in, in Europe. Uh, something that is very important, this is why we are, I can do the talk today, is the researchers, when they applied for the project, they applied for something that is called Open Research Data Pilot. This is something that was uh, part of the Horizon 2020 research projects. You could apply. It was optional. You could apply for that. I have to admit, you got a few extra points. Your application got a few extra points if you applied for that. And uh, this means that you obliged your research team that as much as possible research data will be made uh, in open access by the end of the, of the project. And not just open access, as we discussed today, previously, just like that, but within uh, sticking to the fair principles of research data. Uh, as it said over there, there are two main pillars to the pilot. So we were obliged to prepare data management plan. And at the end, as I said before, we had to provide open access to research data if possible. I stress this because later on we will see that these things uh, can become tricky in some ways. Now, a data management plan is an obligatory deliverable of open research data pilots. 
and there is a designated chapter within the grant agreement, grant agreement that research consortium signs with, uh, with European Commission, open access to research data in which you have to describe what you're planning, how, how you're planning to achieve the openness of data, the fairness, uh, sticking to the fair principles of research data and so forth and so on. This is quite a, a big chunk of the, of the grant agreement. Now before moving on, just a short quotation uh, that you can read, active phase research project. Uh, this cannot be stressed enough. Uh, data storage, one element that everybody that works in research needs to think about. And I remember vaguely a joke that I heard in one of the lectures dealing with, with uh, research data. Uh, you know, you do your research, you do with your data whatever you think, uh, you finish your research, leave the data be, you do some other things, and in three, four, five years time, you get to the situation that you have to go back to your data. I hope your memory is better than mine, but I would definitely forget everything. And what you do, you pick up your phone and you call yourself three years or five years ago. I bet you will not answer that call. So forget it. <laughs> whatever you didn't write down, whatever you didn't prepare in advance, it's gone. So stick to it. OK, let's go into the chronology of our project. The project was approved in summer 2018. And this is always sort of a mixed phase when you get your project approved. Hooray, we got the project, we have the money. OK, we have to start working, and we have to start working hard. So uh, it's, a mixed, uh, it's a mixed feeling always. Uh, and even before everything started, you get approved, but you didn't sign the grant agreement yet. You have to start working. You have to uh, collect the team. You have to put things together. Several chapters of the later signed grant agreement have to be prepared in advance. So you have to have uh, pretty much a lot of things ready even before the actual uh, signing of the, of the agreement. One of the things is appointment of the data protection officer of DPO. Uh, and I was, uh, I was selected to, be, to act as a DPO in, in, in that project. Now, at the end of the October 2018, the grant agreement was signed. And during all this time, we maintained really close contact with the uh, Slovene National so uh, Social Sciences Research Data Archive, shortly ADP. Now, I heard quite a lot of you uh, come from social sciences, so this might be interesting for you. Uh, the others that do not cover social sciences will have to be patient with some things that will more, uh, more or less be, be covering uh, social sciences. but pretty much the, the basis is pretty much the same for, for, for everybody. So uh, close contacts with ADP, the staff was really great helping us out. Without them, I'm not really sure how we would uh, manage everything. And right from the start, they suggested the use of so-called CESDA, Data Management Expert Guide, DMAG, which we will uh, touch, talk about it uh, a bit later afterwards. Now. Uh, it says that the MAG turned out to be a very good tool in research data management and preparation, and so uh, we embrace this this uh, this uh, suggestion. What we expected to to collect, what kind of data we expected to collect, we knew there is going to be a lot of uh, field work, a lot of interviewing, a lot of uh, um, focus groups, so mostly the so-called qualitative data. Now, here, those of you who work in, in social sciences will be more uh, acquainted with the terms I, I'm using. Qualitative data, very little. Quantitative data, as I said before, mostly interviews, focus groups, and something that was uh, quite a lot talked about in the previous presentation, a lot of sensitive data because we will be dealing mostly with uh, children that was stressed before and on top of that children migrants and last but not least most of the children 
were not accompanied by their parents. So we were dealing with, uh, uh, metaphorically spe speaking, highly explosive uh, data informants. So uh, co colleague Anna mentioned before that fair data constantly balances on the border between as open as possible and as closed as necessary. And this was, uh, this was the, the, the cornerstone of everything that we were doing during, during our research. Now, uh, a few formal things. In open research data pilot projects, uh, one of the obligatory deliverables is initial data management plan which is due until the end of the six months, so end of June in 2019, we had to present the initial data management plan. Something that's interesting, and I might mention it right away, we are not supposed to deliver the final version of data management plan. We just had to describe some sort of uh, upgrades that we did to, to data management plan during the, the whole research project. So. Uh, because of that, I mean, six months can seem like a lot of time. Trust me, it's not. Six months go by just like that. Uh, so it, it was necessary that we start implementing some things right away. We had a kickoff meeting in January, late January 2019, not even one month after the beginning of the project. And at the kickoff meeting, we had to start working uh, the appointment of data protection officer. Uh, was uh, was put forward presentation of plans regarding data management. So I was, even before official, I got it officially the, the role of data man management officer, I had to prepare some plans regarding the data management. Um, partners that were going to produce research data had to name one representative in something that we call data management working group, DMWG. And, uh, we presented right away the tool that we're going to be using for uh, preparing of uh, data management plan. I don't know whether it was mentioned during yesterday, to not today, uh, I remember. We were using the DMP online tool, which we will later on uh, closely look. And something that is very important for our research, the so-called ethical board was, <coughs> was named right away. If you look back, thinking of children, migration, sensitive data, vulnerable population, uh, you can right away know that the ethical board and the decisions that the ethical board was making is, is uh, really very important. And a few facts about the yours truly data management officer within the Microate project. I have to admit that apart from the interest in the topic of open research data, openness, open science, and things like that, I had no real experience in data management planning and the real research project, uh, research data management uh, organization. One other thing, I have a degree in archaeology. I have absolutely no knowledge in social sciences whatsoever no methodological skills, nothing. But I, for reasons unknown to me, I seem to be, to the leaders of the project, I seem to be the most appropriate person for that. Now, there are some upsides and downsides with this arrangement. Obviously, insufficient knowledge of research methodology, this is a definite downside for the data management officer within the research project. On the other hand, because of that, because of the lack of uh, knowledge of methodology, of the research methodology, I was forced to work more closely with the research team. I had to bother them with the questions all the time. Listen, what do you think about that? How did you, did, did you actually take care of that? Did you, didn't you? So they were pretty fed up with me. At a certain point, they even stopped uh, asking me, inviting me to the to meetings they had. Uh, one thing, that I already mentioned right now is hidden in the question, is the obvious really so obvious? Now we said before, 15 partners in the project, 12 different countries, 
I also, uh, also uh, administered the Moodle that we used for communication within the project. So I, I know we had 100 plus staff working in, within this project. Some people came, some, some people went, but more or less 100 plus all the time. And you know, no, nobody ever asked a question, are we clear about everything? Is this really clear to everybody? Are you sure? Is this methodologically OK? Did we question the right question? So because of I, I had lack of knowledge of this methodology, uh, it seemed OK, because I also asked some questions that you know researchers sometimes hide behind everything. Yeah, oh, this, come on, don't ask me. I know about it. Everybody knows about it. It's, it's obvious. Well, it's not. So it's good that somebody is, uh, pardon my French, pain in the ass, and ask the questions that are not, oh, goodness, this is being recorded. OK, let's go. Um, I mentioned before the CESDA Data Management Expert Guide. Uh, first of all, I have to explain what CESDA stands for. CESDA is uh, short for Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. Uh, I will not go into details, perhaps just the four uh, pillars in, in within the strategy of, of CESDA, uh, trust, training, technology, tools, and services. They're good. They're really good. I didn't go searching f for much more. They were recommended to us, and I checked it out, and it was really very helpful. I, I can only hope for all the other uh, scientific fields to have a service like that. But then again, coming from humanities, I know that in humanities something like that is absolutely impossible. I mean, anybody from humanities, I know that some of you are. Think of the research data in humanities. Try to compare archaeology, philosophy, linguistics, even within linguistics. You have a corpus, you have literature, you have this, you have dialects, so a nightmare. Coming back to CESDA, I only wish that all the sciences would have, would have something like, like CESDA is. Maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe I'm biased because I, I used, I leaned on them so much, but I think they're, they're cool. If anybody knows of something better, correct me. Uh, something I want to stress, <coughs> They are data archives across Europe, so it sort of overlapped, not completely, but sort of overlapped over the map of our project partners. And they have the aim to promote the results, so they are really there to help you out to, to work with you through the entire process. This is the first part, the CESDA, and now the MEG, Data Management Expert Guide. It's nothing less but data management experts guide. It's a guide that will help you out, uh, and not just the guide that is written. It's interactive. You go into it. It follows you uh, through the pro process. You can start wherever you wish, uh, even though it's really recommendable, recommendable that you at least scroll through the entire uh, guide. Behind the guide, there's real people with real experience. The guide is uh, uh, very much alive. I had to change all the, the pictures because they changed the, 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 uh, the contents and the images so often. And I had the presentation from uh, one year ago, uh, meaning it's really alive. Uh, as I said, there's real people behind, and which is strange, real people that are eager to help you out with all the issues that you have within uh, research data management. Uh, it is, it is uh, done in a really interesting way. Uh, compiling, you see, this is the circle that, that colleague Anna showed before, just in a little bit different manner. Uh, you can start when, wherever. Of course, it would be 
wise to start with the plan, but then you can also start with discover. You go back and you see what was done before, and then you start planning on top of what was done before. Uh, so you can step in. It's sort of a hop on hop off bus, you know, that you have you know, on, on the big cities for, for sightseeing tours. Uh, we will just go briefly through a few things that were interesting uh, within our work. Now, this is the uh, the table of contents of data management expert guide. It is neatly organized, uh, very well managed, unlike the shelves in my office on the picture back there. Uh, so it's easy to, to walk, walk through, to go through all this. Uh, <coughs> as said before, it's real life experts behind all the issues. Each chapter, uh, Remember, we're working on data management plan. So each chapter has sub-chapter titled Adapt Your DMP, Adapt Your Data Management Plan. So you can first go into, look into, uh, into suggestions they have, and they have the really uh, good advice about what you actually can or even have to do within your data management plan. Uh, always sources and further reading. <coughs> and also, if you're working in a consortium big like our research consortium, uh, there's l really a large family of, of says the archives, and they're all working under more or less same uh, rules, same same uh, uh, way of doing it. So you can easily uh, manage and organize a large uh, research uh, research group. One thing, though. The amount of information within this DMEG is enormous. And this can really be intimidating. I remember the first time when I started going through it, I said, oh my goodness, no way, no way. But then you sort of, you know, you start pressing the buttons, you start following the, the, the links, and everything sort of starts to get together within your head, on your paper, on your laptop, and you can uh, actually start working. Uh, just to point out a few things that were really crucial for our data management plan. Uh, within storing security, this is something that was briefly discussed in the previous, uh, previous presentation. Uh, please always bear in mind the, 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 the group that we were working on. Prevent unauthorized access to data. Now, this can be either intentional from someone that wants to do harm to somebody, or you can just push the wrong button and delete something that you were not supposed to delete. Uh, protect personal data. Uh, it was said before, never email together, I don't know, a sheet with coded information and the code sheet in the same mail. Our policy was even stricter. We said at the first meeting, no email sending of any kind of raw data. Nothing. Forget it. All the raw data had to be kept locally, and we had the strict rules described how to handle the local data. You know, you don't go with your telephone or your dictaphone uh, to the informant. You interview him. You go back. You download it. You leave it on the machine, and then you hand the machine over to another researcher that goes somewhere else. This is not supposed to happen. All these things had to be taken care of. Now, unfortunately, I was not there at every interview, naturally. So I couldn't guide and uh, abide about um, guard over everything that was going on. But we had these rules written down, and in good faith, we have to trust the researchers that they actually did by the rules. They played by the rules. And this is about the most, I think, we could do. And uh, since uh, nothing actually happened, we didn't hear about any leakage of data or something like that, we trust that the researchers actually did uh, as was expe expected from them. You see here? Adapt your DMP within part four, sources and further reading.
every chapter has something like that. Next one. One other thing, protect, and within protect, ethics and data protection. This was, again, of vital importance within our project. Uh, it's excellent point of reference when we were working with our ethical board team uh, without quite a few of uh, um, suggestions from the DMEG, it would be it would be tough. One thing that the MEG itself emphasizes is diversity in data protection. Now you can start imagining 12 countries stretching from, I don't know, Portugal, UK, Denmark, Germany, Greece, and everything in between. It's, it's diverse with, okay, legal systems within EU, it's unified, but then there are practices and there are practices. There are ways and there are ways. We had to abide by the law, of course. This was the, uh, the, the absolute must. But still, there are different ways. And uh, the MEG emphasizes that and has some suggestions how, uh, uh, how and, and, and what. Oops. OK. We're coming to the end of the. Uh, data management uh, expert guide presentation. One thing I would like to point out is, again, you can see here, right in the first chapter, fair data. Uh, again, European diversity. And within that, it was suggested uh, how, how to move on, what to use in creating the data management plan. Uh, and it was easy because what we had to do, we had just had to put in the funding institution or the funding program that we were working in, which was Horizon 2020. And right away, it dropped out what data management plan requirements this uh, research program has. And is there a DMP template? Yes, there is. It's via DMP online, which is a, a data management plan online tool that you can use to produce your, your data management plan. Now, is are things clear until now? This is sort of a break that we can make now if there are any questions for the things so far. Everything OK? Good. I'm glad. Now, you can remember from before, it was suggested to use the DMP online. This is an online tool. To me, it's really useful, really great. Uh, nowadays, quite a few other tools exist. I grew fond of this, and I'm sort of a conservative person. I try to stick to something that I choose uh, uh, at the beginning, but um, you can, I can also easily be persuaded into using something else. But uh, for the time being, I will, use, I will use this. We will take a closer look, I hope. Uh, about uh, this tool, because now we moved outside the social sciences, because this tool is fit for everybody, as we will see from some of the cases. Uh, just a few basic information. It's, of course, based on uh, open source code base. It was first developed by uh, Digital Curation Center, DCC from UK. I think that University of Edinburgh was uh, leading all this. Later on, it was uh, uh, the, the University of California Creation Center joined in. Uh, I think this version is from 2017, but the first developed, uh, the first version developed was available already as early as uh, 2010. Uh, this is the sign-in screen for the DMP online tool. Uh, let's just see a few things that are important thing here. First of all, it's in four languages. Now, not everything is translated, but the major issues, or maybe nowadays it, it even is. I didn't, I didn't check if everything is, but uh, you can work work in uh, four different languages. Uh, the help 
menu at this level, at the sign-in monitor, uh, is more or less general about the research data management, data management planning in general, and so forth and so on. Once you enter, once you start working, the help gets uh, much better, much more specific and uh, very helpful. Funder requirements, this is very important. It contains various uh, data management plan templates by research funding either organizations or programs. So you can just pick, okay, I work within Horizon 2020 program, I go to Horizon 2020 uh, uh, template, and there you have it with all the questions and all the issues that you have to, uh, you have to tackle. Uh, something that might be of great interest, especially for, for people who start working with data management plans, there is a uh, wide variety of public data management plans for anyone to inspect, use, perhaps you use as a template, uh, creating your own, and we will try and check some of, uh, some of the public DMPs later on to see how it works. And of course, to be able to work within it, you have to create uh, an account to, to enter. Now, as I said before, just to go back a little bit, at the end of month six, we had to, within our project, we had to have the initial data management plan ready, hand it over to the European Commission for inspection, uh, even before that, standard ethical protocol had to be done until the end of month three, and the largest uh, chapter within uh, standard eth ethical protocol is data protection and privacy. Again, work for data management team. Uh, also, we did something that's called folder structure, file naming, and versioning convention. This sounds a bit uh, strange, and I have to say that researchers said, Ooh. We're not really fond of when I when I um, try to persuade them to use this. Uh, by the end of the project, it grew more and more clear to them that this is really useful. And I will try to illustrate this by something that I heard again in one of the conventions. Uh, a file and a folder should be named in such a way that if it drops on your desk in the middle of the night, you have to know from the name of the file where it belongs to. It's a result, I don't know, from the work package, number three, deliverable, this and that, and it was done there and then. So everything must be contained within the file, file name. Uh, this is very important. It cannot be stressed enough. But uh, this is the summary of our initial data management plan, and I will try and see if we can take a closer look. Uh, oh, here it is, no. Yeah, this is it. Now, let's just quickly go through the things that I was showing you before. You see languages, even UK and US English. It's interesting. The help is really general about uh, how to write, what to write, share, things like that. Data management planning with a lot of links, uh, useful links, uh, which you can use uh, working on. Uh, but let's go to this part, public DMPs. You can see here, and there is a lot of them. You see, and this is just page one from much more pages. And uh, they are divided. Th they all have project title, of course, from which you can see what they are work uh, dealing about. Then you have listed the template that was used to create uh, such a data management plan. You have the organization with, within uh, which it was done, and the owner. Owner is, of course, the, the author usually the main author of, of the data management plan. And if you go through, you have a s basic search uh, device, and you can go through and you can see here that it's about anything, I don't know. Uh, interviews, marine habitat, there's somebody working with habitat, isn't it? So whatever you can, you can, uh, you can find, and you can just click 
on a PDF and get a template of the data management plan. Now you have to know within which uh, within which template it was done, so you have very different uh, levels of, of uh, uh, data management plans. Now you also have something that I mentioned before: funder requirements. But for this, you have to be you have to log on first. Let's just see the list: uh, arts and humanities, biotechnology. These are all templates that you can use when creating your own uh, data management plans. ERC, European Research Council, Horizon 2020. This is something that we that we used uh, within creating our uh, our data management plan. Now, let me sign in so we can check out. This is our data management plan, but first let's just uh, no. Aha, uh -huh, here. Find the requirements. You know about the European Research Council scheme? This is something that every researcher aspires to. This is top of the top. Once you get this grant, you're really happy. You, you get a lot of money for five years and pretty much you can do your research as you would really like to. And regarding the data management planning, it's, oh yes, no. it's very simple. Just a few questions. On the other hand, we were working within Horizon 2020, but as I said before, the new scheme is Horizon Europe. If you check out this template, it goes on and on and on. And these are just the questions. So, but anyway, this is a really useful tool because it helps you out. You don't have to start thinking, okay, what do I have to write? What do, would they be interested in? It's everything here. And now, if you wish, if you're into, we can take a brief look into our data management plan. I have to be honest with you at this point. I didn't finish the final review data management plan yet. I yet have to do it. I have things in written in uh, several files, but not filled everything within the, the app, so we will be able only to go through the initial data management plan now. The first page is just the basic information about the project, grant number, so forth, so on. Contributors, Matthias Sedmark is my colleague, the principal investigator. I was working mostly on that. Now, besides that, there's quite a few other members of the data management working group that had access. They were invited to collaborate with their comments, with that with their input. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't participate as much as I expected them to, to participate. It would really be helpful. Uh, maybe this is partly due to the, if you remember, the, the period 2019 until the end of 2021, COVID struck in, field work was postponed, a lot of prob problems regarding that and maybe I wasn't uh, harsh enough on, in uh, encouraging them, them to, to participate. Here you have the division. The initial data management plan is divided into six sec sections, only nine questions, while the detailed and the final are much more elaborated. And now let's dive into our initial da data management plan to see how the things are. You see nine out of nine questions are 
answered. Let's expand all. Just to give you the basic look of how this works. Remember, I use the Europe, uh, Europe Horizon 2020 template, so all the questions are already within it. You just What you have to do, you just have to answer, tick the questions if they're useful within your research. Then at the one side you have the guidance about all the questions that you have to uh, answer, volume, implications, things like that. Data format, something that Anna was talking before, which format will you be using? So it's, it's guiding you through all the phases. And one other thing, you have the comments, so all the collaborators within the data management plan can comment, you can discuss issues, you can work things out within that. And this goes on. Uh, you always get who was the last person that edited certain, certain uh, issues, questions, topics within the data management plan. And this is about it. This is all that is covered within the, uh, our initial data management plan. It's not really long, rather short. We uh, presented it to the European Commission, uh, Commission at the end of the month six, and it was accepted without, uh, without any objections. So uh, I gather it was, it was done in a good way. Uh, one, some other things that you can work within this DMP online tool. You can share your, uh, your, your uh, data management plan. You can put in a lot of other con uh, contribut contrib contributors to the data management plan. And of course, you can download it in uh, many different ways, mostly as PDF, of course. And that's about it. Are there any questions regarding this tool? It's really very self-explanatory, and it, it guides you through. Uh, it just takes a little bit time that, that you get acquainted with it, and it's uh, really, really very helpful. I mean, working in a group of uh, a lot of people, this. I'm sorry we didn't use it in a way that it could be used. There were some uh, some attempts. Some people did actually go into commenting and, and adding their, their issues, but mostly I was the only person using it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, at the time when I was working on this, there was a bit less tools available, but still some others were. I started working on this one. I started testing this one, and it ticked all my boxes uh, right away. So I just stopped, because I was uh, uh, in a sort of a time clutch. I didn't have the opportunity to go through uh, thorough analysis what different uh, tools would offer or can offer. So. Once I was satisfied with something, I just said, okay, this is it, let's, let's move on. So I'm sorry, I cannot give you any kind of, uh, I know there's many tools, but I cannot give you any kind of uh, comparison, which is better for what and for why. There's one other issue. You would not have to just dive into tools deep, more deeply, but you would also have to dive into research more deeply. Because you know this is this goes uh, both ways. You know, I I imagine that not all templates are suitable for everything. Even though this one is, as we saw before, is really it covers wide within the the public DMPs within uh, the uh, DMP online. You can find PhDs. You can find researches just like that. On the other hand, you find uh, Horizon 2020. You find everything. So it really covers covers it all. And once I saw that, I said, OK. And besides, it was recommended within the CESDA DMEG. You wanted to comment? Sorry? About this tool, uh, the critics do not regard as much the tool as uh, my role in using it. 
as in uh, maybe not only my role but the role of the team that was working within the data management plan because it I think it really wants to encourage the collective work within it but we failed within that uh, the critic of the actual tool I don't know I can't give you I can't give you one especially if we go back to the presentation of my role within the, the project I had no previous experience so, you know, I'm just giving you a case study, I'm giving you an example. Uh, please be modest in judging uh, my work, whether I did it okay or not. I'm glad that the colleague from previous presentation is not here because I'm sure we made some mistakes <laughs> on that account. But uh, I have no critics. It, it ticked all the boxes for me. It really did. It guided me so suitably through, through the, the entire DMP uh, preparation that I was really glad and happy. So, sorry. Any other questions? Okay, so this was it. Let's go back to the... Yeah, that's it, okay. How are we with our time? Until 2 o'clock? Yeah, okay, thank you. So, we're only by the end of the six, month six of our project, but this was the most uh, challenging way uh, period until now. I hope we will be able to move forward more quickly. Now, uh, after month six, a few things happened. One is, as mentioned before, COVID-19. The actual fiel field work should have started by that time, and uh, the lockdown started at the same time throughout the Europe. Field work of the researchers should be done uh, interviewing pupils, teachers, staff within the schools, uh, communities all over Europe. That was not possible. So. The actual research stopped for some time. One other thing, I was given a rather time-consuming administrative job at our institution. So the activity of the data protection officers officer sort of uh, laid back a little bit, again, criticizing myself. But uh, I just want to give you an illustration into how many different uh, things can impact on the work. You know, we were listening to the theory before. And theory is okay and absolutely necessary, but when the real life strikes, things can go a little bit different. Uh, once, when COVID cut, uh, settled down a little bit, the field work started, it became clear right away from interview number one that some solutions that were suggested in our initial DMP have to be reprogrammed and drastically. First of all, we heard before about the anonymization, uh, uh, sensitive data, um, personal data. Uh, the researchers started reporting, listen, some data just cannot be anonymized adequately. They can be anonymized, but then there's not, it, it's not data anymore. You know, it's just, useless bunch of words that cannot be used. So uh, our initial wish, oh yes, we will public everything in open, uh, open access, fair principles, abiding fair principles, this drop down to very little in the end just because of this. Uh, we suggested at the beginning that all the data, data would be stored at our Slovene National Social Sciences Research um, Archive. This came out to be a useless solution uh, because partners and uh, archive would run into great difficulties uh, if we would stick to those, to this uh, one thing quite obvious, the language, the communication, that would be, would be really, really impossible. We had 
as mentioned before, we had ethical board, and ethical board decided upon uh, some things pretty much uh, most of all about the, the which data, data to be archived and which not, and they just decided it's up to each partner because it's also uh, regards the local uh, legislation uh, which uh, data can be arch archived for um, fair fair use later on. And uh, as you will see later on, we came down to very little in the end. And I have my fingers crossed that European Commission will be satisfied with what we did. We mentioned before, as open as possible and as closed as necessary. Uh, during the research time, we had to deal with a lot of ethical issues. Uh, and ethical as aspects of research within MiCreate project were stressed out very much even before the actual project uh, started because we really wanted to have to safeguard the, the integrity of, of children, of migrant children. Uh, so this was uh, put uh, within the topmost priorities right from the start. Uh, qualitative data that we were gathering result from, as said, interviewing particularly vulnerable group migrant children and people surrounding or working with them. Now, standard ethical protocol that was uh, delivered within uh, month three of the project addresses general ethical principles and in more detail uh, issues connected to, to uh, ethics within research methodology. Um, it turned out that collected qualitative data was inevitably full of such sensitive information that was just uh, impossible to adequately use or to be reused in in uh, in uh, obeying abiding by the fair fair principles later on. There are some problems with that. Sorry. And one uh, other thing that uh, I have to emphasize children that were being interviewed, they are not aware of what they're, they are handing on within the interviews. So it's the responsibility of the researcher to take care. You can ask uh, a child, they, he will tell you everything. Once you get his uh, or hers uh, uh, friendship, con confidentiality, they will tell you everything, but they are not aware that such data can be misused uh, used by people that uh, uh, can use them in, in manners that, that are not within the child interest. So it was upon the research and the research team to take care about all these uh, all these uh, things. This is what we collected in the end. Qualitative data, you can see the numbers, and apart from the qualitative data, interviews and focus groups, we also had uh, online survey, 2,724 surveys, questionnaires. And this data, the quantitative data, this is okay. This is just numbers. You know, numbers, questionnaires, uh, informed consents, not problematic at all. This all went to data archives. All the upper numbers, these are video and audio files that first had to be transcribed into text and then anonymized. You add the numbers. I didn't give you the uh, gigabytes and megabytes and terabytes of the data that we had. Along with that go uh, photos, images, films, drawings that the children make. In the end, just a tiny piece of all this data was put to uh, data archives because all the rest is so full with information that could lead to uh, to identity of a child. You know, you can imagine, I don't know, a migrant coming from Somalia, a child ends up in a small local community somewhere in Germany, ends up in a school. Already in this, within this sentence, there's so many information that you track down to him right away. And again, we're talking about migration, and we're talking about children. We all know how 
strongly politicized migration is. And all this data can be misused just like that for some really, really uh, bad and nasty purposes. And since we wanted to really take care about the child interest, as I said in the beginning, we ended up with just a few things that were handed over to the data ar archives, and I'm talking about qualitative data. Well, quantitative data, that was no problem whatsoever. Now, where to put all this data? This is the map of CESDA partners, CESDA archive partners. Uh, if you remember back the map of the project partners of the MiCreate project, it almost overlaps, but not entirely. There are a few countries that do not overlap, uh, like uh, Spain, for instance, but there are some administrative uh, issues there. So the archive that they have, the, the University of, of Catalonia, are OK. Uh, Poland is not a member, but a partner. So that was, that was quite, quite OK. While all the rest, we had absolutely no problems. So instead of using the Slovene National Social Sciences Archive, we just suggested to all the partners that were actually creating data to use the national uh, says the members as the uh, designated data archives. In the end, these are the, data, the archives that we used. ADP for Slovenia, AUSDA for Austria, a member of CESDA, UK Data Service Reshare, also a member of CESDA, uh, CORA, this is an uh, archive that is not actual member of CESDA but abides by all the, the, the re uh, regulations uh, governed by CESDA. Uh, Poland, I think this is not a member of CESDA. Danish National Archives, member of CESDA. Sodanet EK in Greece, member of CESDA. Humanum, I think it's also not CESDA but also works within the same regulations as, as CESDA archives. So we were happy in the end to to be able to, to put all the data that was being put to archives uh, to the almost CESDA members. So why do I put so much emphasis, emphasis on, on CESDA? To me, they're just the best in business in Europe in, in, in social sciences archiving. And uh, if there's anybody that, that have some information that this is not like that, I'm, I'll be easily persuaded. They all use same standards, comparable metadata, referencing uh, PIDs, I mean uh, persistent digital identifiers. In one word, they, their mission is to abide by the fair principles of data sharing. So if you put your data into CESDA archive, you virtually tick all the boxes that you have to tick within your data management plan. Actually, they do it for you. I mean, they help you out. They, they tell you what you have to do. One thing that is, that is a little bit bothering, you know, you're ending your project. You just want to get rid of this data so that you can tick one more box. They go checking on everything that you do. Of course, in the end, you're grateful because they check and recheck and so that everything is totally 100%. But you really don't want to bother with that anymore. You have to. We we heard before, it's 20 versus 80 percent, 20 percent gathering, 80 percent working on data. Uh, one thing that is very important for our project, says the member archives, at least most of them, can handle highly sensitive data. So some of the data that we produced are not available uh, in open access. They are archived. You have to have special permission uh, to to uh, get to this data because our thought was we collected so much data, it would be a waste that everything would just go, uh, would be in vain. At least something that we wanted to collect about everything is metadata about the data so that everybody knows what was already collected, uh, what kind of results we, we got from, from, from research. And then last but not least, I have personal experience with several CESDA archives. They are more than willing to help. 
they really are. You can call them, call them, contact them anytime. They will, they will help you. They will give you actual assistance. They will write you out some things that, that uh, you're not uh, able or capable of doing this. So if you ever get into the position, I would really, as I'm sure you understood by now, I would really re recommend that you use this, this uh, service. Uh, we're coming to the end of my presentation now. Reporting to EC. This, of course, is extremely important. If they are not satisfied, everything fails. Uh, they have to approve what you report, what you do, what you did, actually. There's no going back. Uh, so you have to take care through the entire research process how and what you do. Uh, there is a lot of reporting even during the, the, uh, the project life cycle. As I said before, apart from the deliverables that we were committed to deliver during uh, at the end of the uh, project, uh, regarding the DMP, there is just a short, and it's stressed, emphasized by the European Commission, you have to briefly describe what changes you made to your initial, initial data management plan until your final version of data management plan. So th this were practically f free, uh, uh, free chapters that I had to write down to describe what were the, the changes. And you can remember, from the beginning, we, th we thought everything will be put to Slovene National. No, we chose the other. Uh, archives. First, we thought everything is going to be in open access. No, we had to um, remove some open access to some of the data. Why did we do that? So forth, so on. Uh, and the last thing that uh, we didn't know about, but luckily we we uh, we had our things prepared in that way. It's a list of all open data sets, and there is a de designated form by the European Commission that you have to fill in with information. Uh, once the project is finished, you have a deadline until when you have to uh, put in all the reports for, for the Commission. Administrator of the project fills in the forms, and one of the forms is about open data sets. This is how it looks like once you filled in the form. This is just two data sets from uh, many others that, that uh, were put in. Let's just take a brief look how this looks like. First thing on top of the form is digital object identifier. Now, every serious data archive will give you a uh, so-called PID, persistent digital identifier. Most of the times, this is DOI number, and you have to write this in. If you don't, the f you cannot uh, file in the form. It will not be accepted. So this is very, very important, because something I didn't tell you before is data archives take extremely lot of time to go through your data. It can take months. So if you finish your research, two months before the end of the project, and uh, you then start thinking of about giving everything to the data archive, start negotiating with data archive, and they said, OK, yes, put the data in. It will take you, I don't know, how many months. We ended up uh, at the beginning of the summer. You know how summer is. Oh, it's a time for vacation. We don't have the staff now. We cannot work this on. And European Commission expects you to put all this information in until the end of August. And you cannot write in, oh, I'm sorry, it was the summertime, we were on vacation. They sort of don't accept that. I don't know why, but they don't accept that. So you have to fill in all this information. You see all the red stars. This is mandatory DOI repository link where the data is uh, deposited, title, of course, is it accessible, is it reusable, and if you use says the archives, this is okay, it's just the question, the matter of time. And perhaps it would really be 
useful somehow get back to the European Community, European Commission, to let them know that it's it, this is a bit can get a bit tricky to fulfill all this issue in in uh, something that doesn't look as a short time period, but it actually is, because we still have some data sets in uh, in preparation within data archives. Uh, now, if you're lucky, your national data archive is good with that and you are trustworthy customer, so they will put you the DOI in advance, which is not a good practice, but they can do that, uh, while other archives, they will say, no, 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 no way. You have to wait all the way until the end of the process, only when the data is approved and published, then you will get the DOI. And without that, you cannot fill in the form. Okay. The last one. Lessons learned. What do you think through my story regarding the uh, data protection officer? I think my personal experience is it would be helpful if I would have some background in social sciences before. I had to learn some basics which is okay, it, it's, it doesn't do you any harm if you learn some more things, but it would be easier if uh, I would have some previous experience. On the other hand, if you remember the second or third slide when I was uh, telling you about my institution, humanities, and within humanities we have three different insti institutes, history, linguistics, philosophy, social sciences, biotechnology, and uh, kinesiology, law. So we would have to have a person, a data manager for each of the scientific fields. Now we are an uh, institution with 100 plus personnel, but still we cannot afford to have five, six, seven data management managers, no way. So we have to sort of get by in, in that way. Data protection officer needs to be actively involved in everything. Especially it has to be more uh, strict with guiding the data management work group to sort of persuade them to be more active in, in, in uh, preparations of data management plan. Actually, in all issues regarding the research data management. Uh, one thing that we discussed on previous, uh, previous slide, all the partners, and this again is the role of the data protection officers, but all the partners that produce research data have to contact the selected data archive from the beginning of the project. The sooner you do that, the easier it will be in the end. If you notify them in advance, they will have some things prepared. They, have, they can have some stuff prepared. They will know, OK, you're planning to deliver this at that time. OK, we will have somebody ready for you. We will have somebody ready to guide you through the entire process. This can be really, really very helpful. Uh, Right from the start, you have to let everybody know that this is a really lengthy procedure working on uh, archiving data. And the last line with which I would like to end my presentation, the obvious is never, never obvious. You know, you need to ask questions all the time. You need to bug them. You need to, uh, I don't know check them by, by, by their shirts. And that's about it. Thank you very much.